Hey there, and welcome to Cyberpunk Librarian. I'm Daniel Messer. There was this guy I knew back in my younger days. He was the first contact I ever had with real, honest-to-God data hoarding. And while I'm not a huge data hoarder myself, I will say that I have collections of stuff that I will never... I'll never get through it all, simply because there are not enough hours in my lifetime to get it all done. That doesn't mean I'm not going to try. Also, give me a second, I need to, I need to check on a download real quick. I happen across this open directory and, well, hey, just listen to the last episode. Yeah, yeah, okay, good, that's downloading rather nicely. Okay, so, data hoarding got its start in bibliomania. People collecting books that they don't actually need but they can't help the fact that they want them. If there's anything that the digital world has changed for me, it's that I no longer have an entire room full of books, manuals, magazines. Oh, good lord, the magazines. Yeah, I donated most of that stuff to friends of the library groups as I purchased digital copies or if I happened to find one that, you know, fell off the back of a truck. A, a digital truck. Yeah. Beep, beep. Anyway... I digress. This guy downloaded any PDF of any role-playing game source book he could find, mostly pulling them off Usenet news groups. This was in the early days of ebooks and PDFs, and as it happens, ebooks as PDFs. It was a dark and scary time that history refers to as the mid 90s. These role-playing books were manually digitized on flatbed scanners with a level of love and dedication that would bring a tear to the eye of a modern digital archivist. He was an avid role-player, sure, but he was downloading stuff he'd never play, including source books for games that I was certain he didn't like. He was downloading regular books, too, and he'd sit at the table and read them on his laptop screen. I mean... E-ink readers weren't invented yet, and Apple was a failing company in danger of going under, so there certainly wasn't an iPad. So someone asked him, hey, why are you downloading all this stuff, especially the stuff that you're not even all that interested in? And he said something I'll never forget, and it went like this. Data should be free, but it should also be mine. This is Cyberpunk Librarian, episode 53, Free and Mine. My name is Daniel Messer, your friendly neighborhood cyberpunk librarian, welcoming you back to the show that explores the intersection of libraries and technology, and is all about living that high-tech, low-budget lifestyle. So, data should be free, he said. I was just sticking my nose into library work around that time, and this was something that stuck with me as I grew into the profession that I accidentally fell into. As I started to pay attention to the landscape of information and its accessibility, I watched important scientific research disappear into databases, affordable only to universities, really, not to public libraries or certainly not the public at large. I saw publicly funded research go missing, drawn behind paywalls and paid access and student card needed and pay X dollars a month for a guest pass or whatever. Needless to say, this bothered me. And it still does. While I never got a degree in the field, I've got a pretty strong background in astronomy, specifically exosolar planetary systems. And, and in case you don't follow the science, that's a pretty hot area right now. There's a lot of research I want to read, and it can be a challenge to find it sometimes. Beyond my own selfish needs, I've helped people find articles through interlibrary loan and database research, articles that they need to complete their own research and their own papers. Sometimes, these articles are the things standing between them and their degree. So, what happens when you face a situation where your customer, your patron, needs a journal article locked behind a paywall or buried in a database well away from your normal levels of access. Well, 
As Hunter Thompson said, when the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. So, it's time to go pro. When you're looking for articles from professional research journals, it's always best to start simple and easy. That's because, sometimes, the path from your patron's request to you handing them a printout or emailing them a PDF is almost a straight line. But you won't know until you check, so have a look at the databases your library already subscribes to. After all, it's your job to know these better than your customers do, so it's quite possible they missed something or they didn't check the right one. Many libraries, and I'm sure the one that you might work for if you're a librarian yourself, many libraries subscribe to different different databases. You might have several. Chances are you do have several. So it's, it's quite possible that your customer looked in the wrong place or just didn't look in the right database or they, they looked in the right database, but they just missed the article. Sometimes it's good to just have another set of eyes. Go check just in case. So, when I was handling interlibrary loan, I didn't get too many requests for papers. My expertise, after all, is rooted in public libraries, not academic ones. However, I would get the odd request every now and then from someone who was doing some research for school working on a book, or supplementing their own work and their own research. And when it's down, 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 into the abyss to wrest that article from the depths of the databases, yeah, well, there you are. You're searching multiple sources, running checks on DOIs or digital object identifiers. I'd check databases here, databases there, check with other librarians, and together we would extract knowledge from the digital realms. Or not, you know, because I'd search Google Scholar first. Sometimes the paper is right there. Google doesn't do a whole lot of publicity around their scholarly article search engine, and, you know, that's a damn shame. Sure, the article might be locked behind a paywall, but there are times the publication isn't exclusive to just a journal or one journal. Maybe the authors uploaded the paper to their own website, Maybe the article was published online in another journal. Who knows? I don't much care what happened or what the contract said or who published what where. Most of the time, I just need an article. They don't care where it comes from. And it's always worth checking Google Scholar first. Often, my search ended there, and I'd email the patron minutes later with a PDF of their request, and they thought I was a miracle worker of some kind. But... That was until I told them about Google Scholar. See, a librarian shares their tools. That's what I'm doing here on this podcast, ladies and gentlemen, and genders outside and in between. A librarian shares their tools, and if you've got yourself a researcher who doesn't know about Google Scholar, then tell them. Not only will it make your life easier because they can start looking up their own stuff, but It eliminates a step. If you're dealing with someone on the regular and they know about the Google Scholar stuff and you know that they've checked it, well, then you don't have to check it. You know that they already have. So there you go. But okay, so we've got some easy options. Checking your own databases just one last time and hitting up Google Scholar. So what happens if those easy options fail? Well, bucko, I have just a couple of options for that. But first, a quick message about web browsers. One of my favorite running gags is that my favorite operating system is Firefox, and that's still true, but to a slightly lesser extent these days. See, Firefox is going through some changes. Call it call it technological progress, call it puberty, whatever. Maybe they're growing pains, or maybe they're just horrible ideas dreamed up by the Mozilla team. We'll kind of have to wait and see. Either way, the big change in Firefox right now is that they're phasing out XUL-style add-ons for the supposedly more modern and sexier web extensions style of add-ons. This has caused consternation among developers and users alike. 
See, the short story is some of my favorite add-ons no longer work because they've not been ported over to the web extension style. And for some, yeah, you know, they won't be ported over to the web extension style because web extensions doesn't support some of the things that they do. So Firefox will be going all web extensions sometime in November. And unless you're a hardcore fan, I can't recommend Firefox right now for that very reason. The add-on ecosystem is in a sort of state of flux, and who knows when it'll settle down. I believe we're going to see the end of Down Them All on Firefox, just for one, and I know that that won't be the only major add-on that'll never return in its current form. So if you're wondering why I'm about to recommend a couple of tools based on Chrome, Chromium, or Vivaldi, well, that's why. Because the add-ons and the extension sphere of Firefox just isn't stable right now and likely won't be for several months. I've actually switched to Vivaldi recently as my daily browser since it's got most of the goodness of Chrome, but without all of that reporting everything you've done back to the big G. As an added bonus, Chrome extensions work fine on Vivaldi, so you can have your browser and cake to... Cake? Eat it? No. Eat your browser? No. Something like that. The metaphor starts to break down quickly. Okay, that out of the way, there are two extensions that I absolutely love for finding journal articles behind a paywall. Now, sometimes you can work within and sometimes you have to work outside the normal parameters to get the information that you or your patrons need. So I do admit one of these extensions may seem a little dodgy in that they allow you to dodge paywalls. See what I did there? and get the article that you're after by hook or by crook. So if you're at all put off by that, hey, I get it. I really do. But I'm not put off by that. My job is finding information. So let's do that with Unpaywall and Sci-Hub Links, two fantastic extensions for Chrome-compatible browsers, which is an odd thing to say, but it's the only way I can describe Chrome, Chromium, and Vivaldi without using all three in the same sentence. So, to offer something to folks who aren't bending a few rules to discover articles, let me first talk about Unpaywall, because it's the friendlier solution. Unpaywall is a little extension that is perfectly legal in nature. Indeed, the people behind it, a team called Impact Story, are supported by grants from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and the National Science Foundation. You really can't get much more upfront than that, right? And, as I said, the way it works is 100% legal, so you don't have to worry about skirting any rules or breaking any laws or anything like that. Okay, great. So, what's it do? Well, Unpaywall basically gathers and aggregates content from open access repositories all over the globe. According to their site, they pull out lots of stuff from things like PubMed Central, the Directory of Open Access Journals, or the DOAJ. Google Scholar, and more. So they actually index Google Scholar for you as well. Then they open it up to people using the OADOI API, which is a whole lot of a uh, whole lot of letters strung there together. So this is the Open Access Digital Object Identifier System Application Programming Interface, if you don't know what API stands for. Basically, it's a similar way of using digital object identifiers, but it's specifically geared toward open access. So great, you might be saying. Sounds awesome, you might be saying. Or you might be asking yourself, what in the hell did he just say? Okay, all right, so let me lay this out in easy-to-understand terminology. When a researcher, scientist, analyst, or whatever publishes an article in a journal, it's not unusual for them to sign away exclusivity for only a limited time. In other words, they promise not to publish that article anywhere else or upload it anywhere else for a given amount of time. This could be a few months or a year or whatever. However, once that time has passed, many researchers will upload that article someplace, maybe to their own website as part of their curriculum vitae or just maybe as a way to call attention to their hard work, it might go up on their university's website. Moreover, even before the article is published, 
they might upload a draft of the article to a preprint server or something like Archive. And that's A-R-X-I-V, not the Internet Archive. Though, I suppose they could upload it there too. I mean, why not? Unpaywall takes a look at the page that you're viewing and tries to figure out if there's an article on there that might be locked behind a paywall and where that article might be found elsewhere. Quite simply, it looks to see if the page contains a DOI. If so, it'll run that DOI against its own database and try to provide free access to the article on another site. So this is exceptionally good for older articles as the exclusivity agreements have expired and the authors can upload it to multiple places if they desire. Even better, Unpaywall is privacy conscious. It transmits the DOI back to their servers using HTTPS, and while they do log your IP and the DOI, they don't really take anything else, and your IP can't be readily traced to your identity. And the extension itself doesn't try to fingerprint your browser to keep track of you or your usage or any of that weird, creepy stuff that so many online agencies are into these days. All in all, it is pretty freaking neato, my friends. Moving beyond Unpaywall, let's dive into the gray zone, and here's where we may separate from some of the audience because we're going to talk about Sci-Hub for a few minutes. Now, for those who don't know what Sci-Hub is, well, let me explain it by first asking a question. Have you ever watched an episode of the TV show Law & Order? Each episode starts out with a brief monologue that goes like this. <clears throat> In the criminal justice system, the people are represented by two separate yet equally important groups, the police who investigate crime and the district attorneys who prosecute the offenders. <laughs> So let me use that as a foundation and build upon it to explain to you that <clears throat> in the academic research system, information is presented by two separate yet equally important groups, the researchers who conduct the studies and write articles about their results, and the publishers who try and force you to pay $60 or more for a PDF of that article. Sci-Hub is to academic papers and articles what the Pirate Bay is to... Well, everything else, I suppose. Where the Pirate Bay offers goodies galore from music to video to ebooks to ebooks about music videos, Sci-Hub provides access to academic research papers normally locked away in highly expensive databases and collections where, if you're not a student at a university or otherwise don't have access, you'll wind up paying through the nose for a downloaded, likely DRM-laden PDF. There are two basic sides to the Sci-Hub argument. On one side, you typically have the scientists and researchers who actually kind of like Sci-Hub because they want people to see their work. On the other side, you typically have the publishers who look at Sci-Hub as a cancer and view the people who use it as criminals. In case you didn't realize, the academic publishing world is big business. Access to a single database can cost a library tens of thousands of dollars per year, and that's for the inexpensive ones. Depending on the database, it could be a six-figure subscription fee paid annually to a given publisher. And to make it worse, publishers will often break up their content into separate databases. You want business articles? Well, that's one database. Oh, you want scientific articles too? Well, that's another different database. Oh, you wanted medical articles? Yes, I know medicine is kind of a, you know, is totally tied to science, but yeah, that's still another database. Yes, you'll need to buy them separately, but if you ask nicely, they'll bundle them together in a way that's still outrageously expensive. A university can easily pay millions of dollars per year for access to online collections of journals and articles. Meanwhile, it's quite common for the authors of these articles to get paid nothing for the article. After all, they work in a publisher parish environment where they have to get articles out there or they could lose their job. So the writers are paid through a university salary or through grant funding or maybe a research budget or a mishmash of all of this and something else. 
On the publisher side, it's not uncommon to pay nothing for an article and used unpaid editors and peer reviewers to go through that article before publication. Either way, just like the music industry, it's always the publishers and the distributors who make the big bucks. So naturally, they see Sci-Hub as a threat, just as the music industry saw Napster as a threat. It cuts in on their bottom line, and to further the parallel, many musicians had no problem with Napster, and some even spoke out for it. Because a musician wants to be heard, just like an academic wants to be read. The creators have competing and diverging goals from those of the publishers. Okay, okay, okay. Screeds aside, we'll leave that to one side. I have no problem using Sci-Hub for the very reason that often I need an article. One. One article and only one. Most of the time I need a single article at a time. Maybe I'll need a different one tomorrow or next week, but usually I just need one at a time and so do my customers. So when all else fails, when you've tried all the normal roads and they all lead to the same dead ends, you have to forge your own path. And to help with that is Sci-Hub links for Chrome. As I said, it also works on Chromium and Vivaldi. So Sci-Hub Links is a very simple add-on with a very simple operational model. It scans the page you're looking at for a DOI. If it finds one, it will reference the Sci-Hub database for that DOI, and if it finds it, it'll provide a link on that page to the article on Sci-Hub. Even better, if that DOI is a link itself to some kind of DOI resolver, it'll replace that link with the link to the article on Sci-Hub. All of this is done more or less instantly and transparently when you load the page. It's quick, it's easy, it's efficient. And it has saved my butt on more than one occasion. A July 2017 article in the International Business Times talked about how Data analysts at the University of Pennsylvania, University of Texas at Austin, Goethe University, Frankfurt, and Bidwise, uh, they, assessed, they assessed the content of Sci-Hub and found over 56.3 million papers available. That's two-thirds of the estimated total of 81.6 million academic papers in the world. I've included a link to that article in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast, but I warn you that the website has one of those damned annoying video content windows that does its best to stay on top of the content even if you scroll down the page. It sort of follows you and keeps talking and keeps going. <sighs> yeah. Anyway, the point is, if you're looking for an academic paper and you can't find it anywhere else or you can't access it anywhere else, there is an extremely high chance that you will find it on Sci-Hub. And yes, that includes fairly recently published papers. Okay, so there's one more avenue to explore where we can find academic papers and research, and it's a fantastic resource, but let me tell you, it's a whole lot better if you're willing to share, too. Because, you know, another good way to get an article that you just can't get your hands on, you know, for whatever reason? Well, you can just ask for it. Reddit is a multifaceted place with many spaces and lots of faces. There's a good and bad side of it, just like any major site on the web. But one of the good parts, indeed one of the best parts of Reddit is the Scholar subreddit. r slash scholar is a place with a purpose, and that purpose is sharing academic papers and materials. You can request articles, books, and scans from the great r slash scholar hive mind, and with luck, you'll get the very thing you need. All you need is a free Reddit account and a few minutes to read the sidebar on the subreddit. They have some rules about how you post your request, not because they're being sticklers or because they're very uptight or anal about how you phrase your question. No, no, no. It's because the format of your request is important to getting it seen and fulfilled. They've got some clever filtering in place so you can see unfulfilled articles, and that's very important because, folks, 
If you're going to venture into our scholar looking for help, well, be a good person and be willing to offer a little help back. Now, you might think you have access to bog standard dirt common databases, but I guarantee you the database that you see at every single library you visited isn't available everywhere. Small town Missouri doesn't have that one, nor does Tinyville, South Dakota. The point is, you might think your library doesn't have anything special for database offerings, but you know what? It doesn't matter. If someone can't find the article that they need, they don't give a flip. If it comes from ProQuest or EBSCOhost or Gale or any of those databases that you commonly see in the larger libraries, they don't care if it happens to be the scan of a printout that you had on your desk, if that's the thing that they need to finish that paper, tidy up their research, get that degree, and achieve their goals. So hopefully now, your job is a little bit easier when it comes to that kind of thing because you have a few more tools in your toolbox. And hey, keep in mind, our scholar is there for sharing. So sharing works both ways. It's really nice if you participate too. And that wraps up another episode of Cyberpunk Librarian. I thank you so much for tuning in and sticking with the show. I know these things come at infrequent intervals and life is a little crazy sometimes and I'm not even going to bore you with the details. But hey, thanks for tuning in and I hope you picked up some tips and tricks for finding those sometimes hard to find articles or at least those articles that might be easy to find but not so easy to get a hold of. The tune you're currently digging on is Sentimental by Sro. Earlier in the show, you heard Work and Wander With Me by Ketza, and as always, the opening track is Belly Dance at Ibisu by Ryo Miyashita. You'll find links to those tunes in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast, where you'll also find links to all of the things that we talked about here on the show today. So be sure to hit that up, and that way you don't have to keep furiously scribbling things down. I'm trying to be really good about getting anything that's important enough into those show notes. Cyberpunk Librarian is hosted by the Internet Archive at archive.org. Great people doing great things. Some of the most important things in our digital world is saving and archiving the digital world itself. So big shout outs and big thank you and lots of respect to the people over at the Internet Archive at archive.org. Check them out. You'll find all kinds of goodies from podcasts to video games to videos to music great stuff and great people thank you so much to the internet archive for all of your efforts if you'd like to get in touch with me well i highly suggest that you do so you can follow the show on facebook at uh, facebook.com slash cyberpunk librarian you can also hit me up on twitter where i am at librarian that's b-i-b-r-a-r-i-a-n it's like librarian but it starts with a b or if you prefer the old-fashioned email smtp methodology you can always email me at cyberpunklibrarian at protonmail.com. I'm always happy to hear from the listeners. I'm kind of slow to respond sometimes, but believe me, I love reading your ideas and suggestions, and I do tend to incorporate many of them into the shows. I mean, hey, my listeners are some smart people, and it's great to get some good ideas. And just a quick plug here, just for the next show, I'm doing something a little special given uh, certain events that are kind of happening in the cyberpunk world. So um, you might really check out the next show. It won't be as techie focused as we're going to be looking at one of the seminal pieces of cyberpunk culture. So I don't want to. I don't want to spoil that just yet. I might have said too much already, but I don't care because I'm super excited. And I hope you tune in. So I'll see you next time on Cyberpunk Librarian. And hey, remember, you don't have to be high tech to be low budget. But you know, it certainly helps if you're a cyberpunk. Take care. I'll see you on the next episode.